What's up guys and gals and welcome back to the Nerd Castle. Today in the world of indie games, we're gonna be checking out a little tiny title that's actually I think got some merit to it. This game is called Shadows of Forbidden Gods. This is a weird title in all honesty. The best way that I know how to relate it to you as a viewer is that if you've ever seen Ruin Arc before, Ruin Arc is a game where you are a dark god that is awakening from a slumber to mess with somebody's Rimworld colony. This game is Crusader Kings if you were a dark god coming to ruin the entire world. And so effectively there's a lot of little influences in here. It's got RPG, it's got strategy, it's got 4X, it's got a bunch of stuff, but the basic premise is that you are a dark god that has been asleep for 1,000 years and you are slowly awakening. And your job is to spread cults all around the planet so that you can slowly ensorcel, drive mad, or otherwise coerce all of the leadership into the world into fighting underneath your banner and becoming your servants. Along the way, you're going to have a rival. There's an Aragorn or Frodo-type character that's going to be trying to unite all the countries against you, culminating in a massive battle between the forces of good and evil near the end of the game, and you are trying to stop that by any means possible. You can rob banks, you can knife people in their sleep, you can let loose plagues, you can summon armies of zombies to besiege places, you can befriend orcs, uh, you can convert people into deep folk, sort of Lovecraftian style. There's lots of little things in this game, and I'm not going to pretend like I know about all of it. I've played for a couple of hours, and I've got a rough idea how to play the game. I wouldn't expect me to play this at, like, ap absolute, like, optimum levels, because this game with a lot of moving parts. But... I feel like at this point I do have a pretty good idea of what actions and what things you can do as you play the game. This is probably going to be a longer video just because it's going to be really hard to condense this game into 30 minutes with all the things that need to be explained and talked about. But I'm going to do my best to move through it and I figure the video will end when it ends. So anyways, if after watching this you wanted to get Shadows of Forbidden Gods for yourself, it's in early access. There is a link down below in the description. From what I can tell, the game's been out for a while. I had like an early copy of it, but it was very primitive back then. And so anyways, I've been watching it sort of develop and I think now is the time. On top of that, you'll also be able to find a link to my Twitch stream and my Discord in case you wanted to hang out with me. I know, ew, who wants social interaction? But for those of you that just are rambunctiously excited about interacting with other human beings, whoever you may be. Those links will be down there for you as well. Let's go ahead and start off a new game at the beginning. We've got to decide what god we want to play as. That's right, this game has multi-god capacity. Uh, we can be She Who Will Feast. She Who Will Feast is effectively an all-around god. She does, like, everything average. Uh, that's why they give her to you as the first goddess that you can play as, and you're trying to consume the planet here. There is... Easter, the Laughing King, and so anyways, there is a book with him that you have to deploy places, and heroes are going to be trying to find this book. The book is basically a booby trap that slowly corrupts whatever area it gets left in, and if the heroes capture it, bad things happen. Uh, there's Venerva, who is actually, Venerva's kind of interesting because she's a goddess that convinces everybody that she's a goddess of goodness and like fertility, and then kind of flips the switch on them, and it turns out that she's actually not so good of a guy. Uh, we've got Or Orphanim, the Divine Beyond. This guy is basically a false prophet. Uh, he's a fallen angel that effectively convinces people to follow him, but he has, like, evil machinations at heart. And then there's Mammon, which obviously it rotates around making people greedy and turn on each other and cause civil war and turning trade lanes into strife and so on and so forth. So anyways, I only have She Who Will Feast unlocked right now. I haven't managed to pull out a W in this game just yet, and you gotta pull off a W before they give you all the other gods. However, I have done a couple of extended plays, and it's gone okay. Like, I haven't been the best dark god, but I haven't been a pushover either. I mean, I've been assassinating and stabbing and casting magic spells and doing everything. Everything I can. So she who will feast is a god worm, a terrible creature from the black of the void between stars who has lain dormant for millions of years until the stars are ripe for her awakening. A time will come where she will devour the world and journey forth to lay her brood, dooming other worlds to be consumed by her offspring. Let's go. She's got a couple of things that she does. Uh, she's good at spreading shadow, which is one of the basic things you have to do in the game in order to win. And so that's nice. Uh, she's got awakening, so at a certain point in the game, the she who will feast will actually be a unit that will be deployed on the map as like a giant worm that starts terrorizing the world. And she starts out weak and she gets stronger and stronger to the point where she can like dominate entire armies. And so anyways... That's another one of her mechanics. And so let's dive on in. This game is highly customizable. 
Uh, so if you are a fan of games that allow you to tailor your gameplay experience, there are lots and lots and lots of options here that basically make the game easier or harder while you're learning to play. In general, the larger your world size is, the harder the game is going to be. The smaller your world size is, the easier the game is going to be. Let's go ahead and get a random world seed generated over here too. You can choose a baseline difficulty. I'm not going to mess with any of the advanced options here because like you guys don't understand the game to begin with. So in a lot of cases, like a lot of this stuff is not going to make sense if I tried to explain it right now. We'll leave everything on default, we'll put it on normal difficulty, and we'll pop on in. Okay, so let's go ahead and turn off these hints over here. It looks like we have spawned on a little island, and this is the way that you're going to play the game. It's got like a very, very basic fantasy world map. The first thing that I like to do is identify where the chosen one is at. Every single time you play this game, there's a guy that is controlled by the AI called the chosen one. And this guy is the fundamental mechanic by which you lose the game. So the chosen one is going to cruise around the map and he's going to do a couple of things. And what he does sort of depends on what you do. If you're a god that really relies on military might then what the Chosen One will do is he will cruise around the landscape and he will attempt to make treaties between all these countries and form an alliance to stop the Dark God from arising. If you use a lot of magic spells and a lot of assassination and a lot of subterfuge and things like that that can't be directly militarily faced, uh, tends to be the case that the Chosen One will become more like Gandalf and he'll go around and he'll find artifacts and he'll pick up treasures and he'll find maps and he'll find scrolls and things of that nature and eventually once he's got enough of them he will create a ritual of binding somewhere on the map that will try to basically restrain you for another millennia. So anyways, the UI, things that you need to know here. We've got our power. This is basically our MP. It fuels our spells. Seals Broken is one of the mechanics of She Who Will Feast. Uh, so basically every turn, seals will go up. So the next seal breaks in 11 turns. And every time a seal breaks, it means that you become more conspicuous, which means that the world becomes more aware of you but you also become more powerful. Uh, agents, that's how many people we can have actively working for us, is like our main henchmen. And recruitment points are just a currency that you use in a direct one-for-one -one trade to get more agents. Down here, we have our first guy, the Supplicant. And the Supplicant is up here in this Elder Tomb. He always spawns inside a tomb somewhere. And so the Supplicant is just this lone cultist that believes in us right now. And we need this guy to go out and do things. So anyways, every single minion in this game is going to have stats. Uh, might is how good they are at fighting. Lore is how good they are at magic and spells and rituals and kind of traps and things of that nature that have to do with magic. Intrigue is how good they are at subterfuge, assassination, burglary, uh, things like that, like skullduggery, effectively. And command is how good they are at commanding the attention of crowds and armies and basically getting their voice heard. So you can really think about it like strength, intelligence, and like dexterity, and, you know, like charisma. If you really, really wanted to boil it down, although intrigue, I guess, couldn't be entirely condensed into dexterity. Uh, this guy is a level up. We're going to do that real fast. With his level up, he gets a trait. He's got three traits that we can pick from at the beginning of the game. They're always the same. Uh, he's got conduit, so whenever he enshadows an area, we get two MP back. Uh, we've got the dying light, so while he is inside of a human settlement, shadow will increase by 1%. We'll talk about that in a minute and what that means. And then martyr for the dark, is actually really, really good, too. Uh, Martyr for the Dark basically turns this guy into a time bomb, and it means that if he is killed inside of a settlement, you will automatically infiltrate every single edifice inside that area. So you will infiltrate the government, you will infiltrate, you will infiltrate, like, the organized crime, you will infiltrate basically every aspect of society will have one of your cultists in it. Uh, which is actually kind of a very interesting play style, because if you go with Martyr for the Dark, it basically means that you're trying to kill this guy as soon as possible inside of a major city. Uh, but anyways, we're gonna go with Dying Light for right now, because I think that plays into She Who Will Feast's ability a little bit better. 
the basic idea of the game for right... Well, let's finish the UI off. So he's got HP. When that goes down to zero, he dies. He's got sanity. When that gets down to zero, he goes mad and he's no longer useful to you. His attack and his defense are related to his might. That's his home right there. This is the family tab. All of these characters you have around, like this mage, uh, they will have a family listing right here of people that they know on the planet. And different families will have kind of different attributes and different traits. And some of them will be ambitious. Some of them will be greedy. Some of them will be incorruptible. Some of them will be truthful. And identifying weak points that correlate with what your god is good at is a major part of winning. And so, like, if you're trying to get into a city and you want them to support you as the Dark Lord, you want to find somebody that's, like, ambitious or somebody that's, like, greedy and you want to play on that. Mammon would play on the greed. Whereas, like, the ambitious people, that's where She Who Will Feast will really, really come kind of benefit because they're going to be more likely to fall for darkness in return for power or whatever. And so anyways, lots of little layers to this game that you need to be aware of. With our supplicant, you can also have gold. Gold is individual to the characters. They can hand it off to one another, but your gold pool in this game is not shared. And so you'll probably want to create like a network of caches at one point or another where you can squirrel away your money and basically have like 500, 600 gold sitting there. So anybody that needs money can just grab it real quick to go do what they're going to do, whether it be bribing guards or hiring mercenaries or paying armies or whatever else. We also have two very important stats right here that you need to be aware of. Profile and Menace. Profile and Menace on your agents are two separate stats that do very specific things. So Profile is effectively how many people know about you. So the higher your profile is, the more famous you are. Now it's possible to have like 35 profile and no Menace, which means that you're very, very famous, but like people don't really think anything of you. Uh, profile is basically how publicly visible you are with regards to like how many people know you and have heard of you. Menace is what they've heard. The higher this number is, the more villainy that you've perpetrated. And so in combination, basically profile makes it easier for heroes to find your agent and kill your agent. And menace is basically the onus for them to go on that quest. So you can have really, really high profile and really low menace. And heroes probably won't come after you because menace is really how big of a threat you are. Uh, but if you have really, really high menace and really low profile, it means that you're squirrely. It means that, like, you've done a lot of really bad things and people are actively trying to find you, but you're very, very difficult to lock down and locate. And so, anyways, those are the two stats on your little dudes that you should be aware of. Now, the basic, I guess, structure of the game is there are a bunch of villages here. And as you can see, all of these towns are divided up into, like, counties or, like, countries. And if you look right here, we've actually got a nice little spread. So we have a number of covens over here, which is really good for us. We have an elder tomb here, which is really, really good for us. Uh, and then over on this side, we've got villages. Now, we need to infiltrate a city, and these two numbers are the most important numbers that you need to be aware of in the early game. Infiltration is basically how close you are to establishing one of your cults inside of that city. Enshadowment is how infiltrated your cult is into the community. So if you take my meaning, this is basically a binary yes or no, does your cult exist inside this city? This right here is how much of the general population has now joined your cult. And so, like, you're trying to get both of these numbers up to 100 because that gives you a lot of influence. Basically, once you have enshadowed, like, the entire communities, it means that every priest, it means that business leaders, it means that financiers, it means that bankers, it means that lords, it means that, you know, the general population are now all a part of your religion and thus open to your suggestion. And so as you ensorcel these areas and you enshadow them and people join your church... Uh, you gain influence, basically, and you can begin telling kings and, like, monarchs and dukes and things what you would prefer that the church would have them do, basically. Uh, and so it can be very, very useful. For right now, this place has a security rating of 8. That means it's going to take us for ever to infiltrate this place uh, on every single location there's going to be a number of activities that you can do in this sidebar what we're looking to do is infiltrate and by infiltrating that will allow us to begin in shadowing and so anyways by infiltrating the outer areas 
you will gain influence in those areas and you can begin to kind of influence the economics and the food shipments and whatnot to lower the security of this location. So like taking a look right here, these guys have a very, very, very low amount of food. And so that to me is just instantaneously a weak spot to lower their security is we can start a famine. And they've got two villages right now that are providing food to this major city. So were we to go down here and establish our cults in these two villages, we could then kind of either rob or halt or burn the food supply, and in so doing, lower the security of this place, thus making it easier to infiltrate, so on and so forth. So I'm going to bring my agent down here. Your agent can only move one space per turn. And now that he's down here, I would like for him to infiltrate this farming community. It's going to raise his profile by two, and it's going to raise his menace by seven. So there you go. It's going to take 19 turns for him to get that done. That is a very, very long infiltration time. Uh, but they've got a security of one over here. So like, what else can you really do? Occasionally, you'll find locations like abbeys and whatnot that will have a security of zero. But they tend to be kind of few and far between and kind of hard to find. Normally, a security rating of one is going to be about the lowest that you could ever get. The city of Rient down here is a really prime target. That's a major city that only has five security. Actually, be pretty easy to infiltrate. All right, so he's doing his thing over here. Now, the next thing we need to do is we need to conjure another agent. Uh, we want an agent that's going to be very, very good at infiltration for right now because we're setting up our basic cult network. And so these guys up here, these are unique agents. They tend to be a little bit better than the generic agents, but the unique agents, if they die, they are dead for good and you will like never see them again. That's it. They are a resource that you have cashed in. So in general, you don't want to use your unique agents for like the little trifling stuff if you can help it. You want to use them for the really, really big stuff and then hide them away and basically have them lay low until their stats go back down. And like you want to use them kind of sparingly basically unless you have a target that needs to be taken care of like right now. At the moment, we can get a Hierophant, we can get a Warlord, or we can get a Warlock. The Warlock is going to be really good at magic and doing things like installing Wells of Shadow, which cause your evil to spread throughout the realm. The Warlord is really good at fighting and basically holding off enemy armies, but we need to convince the Orcs to join us before we can do that. The Hierophant is basically just a, a street preacher. Like, you know those guys in every major city that are walking around like booty ass naked with like a sign on their neck that says the end is nigh? Uh, that's basically this guy right here. He's going to be the guy that convinces people that there's something up. I think what I would like to do... Let's deploy the courtier. And we'll put him in the city of Yang. There we go. Uh, so he can be a man of means. That means he'll have 150 gold to start out with. He can be a familiar face. While in this unit's home location, that location loses three security. Wow. Uh, noble connections. While in a city, that location will lose one security. So long term, this is better. Short term, this is better. Man of Means is also very, very good. Uh, your average unit in this game only costs like 20 gold. And so this guy could actually hire a full fleet of bodyguards pretty early on in the game or hand that money off to other people so that they could get a bunch of bodyguards. But 150 gold, it'll probably take me like 20 turns to rob that much from the vault once we take over the city and like embezzle. So I think we'll be okay. I'll probably go for familiar face for right now. Uh, because that's much, much quicker. And as you can see, now it only takes us 125 progress in order to take over this city. So anyways, how does that work? Well, you've got your Intrigue stat. Basically, every turn, your Intrigue stat gets added to the progress right here. And when it hits 75, you have fully infiltrated this area. I would like for this courtier to move over to Kion Village. And his job is going to be to infiltrate Kion while we wait for this guy to infiltrate Hanpin. Is that what that place is called? Uh, handpin key. Okay. Uh, we've pretty much done everything we can do on our turn. So we're going to end our turn real fast. And then we're going to have him move over to Kion Village and he's going to infiltrate. Uh, we have lots of places to lay low right now. So on certain tiles, there will be an ability called lay low. And that allows you to lower your menace and lower your profile. Uh, and so really, you can swing into any of these covens and any of these tombs if that's what you want to do. That's why I was actually kind of stoked that we started out with an isolated area. 
uh, that can't easily be gotten to. Heroes are going to be hard-pressed to come up to the north end of the map and mess with us, no matter how high our profile gets. And so, like, we're actually in a really, really good position here for the beginning of the game. I'm going to bypass a couple of turns, and we'll see what happens here. Every ten turns that you're actively engaging in an activity, you will have to resolve an event. That event is usually negative, but sometimes can come out a net positive. Just sort of depends. So here's our event. The supplicant has found that the military presence here is forceful. They can either comply and waste their time or ignore requests and get negative attention. Um, get negative attention. That's fine. Uh, this message right here, there's lots and lots of flavor text. Uh, but basically, we're going to get a lot of spam right now. Uh, because heroes and rulers from all over the world as we break this first seal are becoming aware of she who will feast. They might have just heard it as like a murmur or like a rumor, they're not going to act on it. Like sometimes this message can make it seem like they're going to come after you like instantly. They're not. This always happens within like the first eight to 10 turns. It's just word is getting around like that there's a prophecy and like maybe that prophecy is not so good for humanity and like people aren't actively paying attention to it yet, but soon they will be as you start manifesting that prophecy. So I'm just going to disable that message so that it's not popping up every you know, other turn. The guards patrol as orders and the watchmen do their duty, but none watches patiently and gossip as often as the elderly women of the city. A vast network to rival any spy master could craft. They are becoming suspicious of the courtiers' comings and goings, muttering about their presumed misdeeds and motives. They may not suspect the truth, but they certainly have experience enough to note when something is wrong and when someone is hiding something. So we can gain 10 profile, we can murder them, which will give us 10 menace, or we can abandon the... Let's just take the profile for right now. The seal is broken and your god is becoming closer to their return. Our maximum power has gone up, so we have more MP now. We have eyes in the shadows. This will boost infiltration at a selected location. Uh, when it says boosts, it means that you instantly infiltrate that place. It's a really good power. I'll show you how it works on this fort over here. So there you go. Boom. Select and look at that. We now control the fort. Our cult has instantly been deployed over here. I think every 15 turns we get an MP back. So, like, you can't be spamming spells like crazy unless you build for it. But for right now, with these guys working on their task and that already taken over, as you can see from that growing black tree right there that's overtaking the tile, we're in pretty good shape right now. And we are actively in shadowing all of these areas over here. This place has been 15% in shadowed already which is good because that means i can build a well of shadows what does the well of shadows do uh, the well of shadows begins in shadowing everything it's adjacent to by at like a percent or two per turn which basically allows you to take over everything it's basically a magical well of darkness that we're hiding in the sewer systems or something all right so I think we've not left to do but wait i think that's where we're at is we just need to chillax for a minute the supplicant has completed infiltrating the farming community. New faces join the harvest, telling tales of travel from afar and following a new faith unheard of in the farming community. While the locals are reserved and cautious, the newcomers are generous and unwaveringly polite. And then the courtier has also completed his infiltration. So yeah, we're pretty deeply infiltrated right now. Like, we're, we're in this thing. We're in this thing big time. Uh, we do have an army here this army is basically a garrison that's inside the city you don't need to worry about it this mage is a potential issue because she's pretty strong so i don't know if i should lay low for a little bit or if i should just do the well of shadows now like a well of shadows will take 20 turns to deploy right here but i think it's a really good idea while this guy goes back and lays low so that's what he's going to do. And then maybe we'll infiltrate this coven. Maybe we'll infiltrate this tomb right here. Oh, the tomb is already fully in shadowed. Hooray for me. All right. Sounds good. Uh, pretty soon he should level up as well. Oh, yeah. He just leveled up right there. Uh, let's give him a... So a couple of options here. You can increase any of his stats by one, which will obviously make his tasks go a little bit quicker. Uh, so that would lower us from 20 turns down to about 13 turns in order to enshadow this area where we're going to give him some extra lore. Intrigue would make him better at murder and assassination, which is always kind of a nice thing to be good at. 
Uh, we can also go with some stats here, or a trait. Uh, we can go with Infamous. So Infamous basically means that the heroes think that this guy is the leader of the cult. So when they kill him, everybody simultaneously that works for you, all of their profile and menace drops by a huge amount. And then on top of that, it lowers world panic by a fat amount as well. Um, so this is a really good ability for any character you're planning on sacrificing anyway, so you don't really care about. Uh, it's a really, really good ability that you can kind of use to stop yourself from losing the game if you plan it right. There's also Stealthy. Uh, stealthy basically means that every single turn he loses .1 profile, which means that no matter how high your menace gets, this guy is really hard to find because he's constantly losing profile. And the heroes can only see a number of tiles out that's equal to, I think, they can see one tile out for every 10 profile you have. Which means that, like, if you have really low profile but really high menace, they have to, like, look around to find you, basically. Like, they have to kind of, like, incrementally go through the map to seek you out, or they have to catch you in the act of doing something gnarly that points out your location. And so that can be pretty good, too. For now, I'm just going to give him the lore bonus so that he gets this done in 14 turns rather than the other turns that we had going on. He's laying low. It's going to take a while for laying low to be finished. So I'm just, ooh, what is this guy doing? He's combating banditry. So this is Mediator Alarash Lease. Okay, so this is one of the heroes that's on the map. He's not a chosen one, but he is a champion of one of the factions. And so apparently here they have a problem. Wow, they do actually. They have a lot of banditry. 75% banditry? That's the highest number I've ever seen. Man, ain't nothing getting out of that neighborhood. Everybody's taking a piece. It's like Chicago in the 1920s. The whole thing is run by the mob. Okay. That's actually an interesting thing to take note of, though, because we can blame some of the issues later on. If they start sniffing around being like, so what has this cult done? We can kind of blame it on the bandits over here later on in the game, so that's good. We can believe it wasn't us, it was the bandits! We're just totally normal guys in black cloaks and torches. Another seal is broken. Uh, your god comes closer to their return. Maximum power has gone up. We can now have a third agent, which is great. And then we have a Fleeting Servant a spell that we've been given. What this does is it creates a fake quest. So what this spell does is it will create a fake kind of, I guess, red herring quest in a spot. So it will create a quest that has really high profile and really high menace. And what that means is the champions and the heroes will think that they need to take care of that in order to stop you from, like, advancing the game, basically. And so they will drop what they're doing, and they'll go after that. And it really results in nothing. It basically just wastes their time. And so anyways, if you need, like, 15 turns in order to get something really gnarly done without getting caught, Fleeting Servant can be very, very helpful in order to get them off your case. Uh, one thing that we haven't talked about yet is world panic so you have 500 turns to conquer the world world panic is basically how freaked out people are about your return so like right now it's pretty low but if it gets up to like a hundred percent that's really 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 not good and one thing that this game does exceptionally well is that this game has a very crunchy ui with like a lot of moving parts and it can be kind of scattered from time to time but one thing where the ui excels is this game tells you exactly what everything costs you and exactly what you will get for every single action and i actually really really respect that and like it uh, so right here it tells you on that little menu right there what happens when the world panic and awareness of you gets to certain levels so so at 10%, heroes will start exploring ancient ruins uh, to find out, like, who you are and, like, what you're up to and how to stop you. Uh, at 15%, rulers will start paying heroes to go and do that. At 25%, the chosen one is now able to undertake the quest to stop you and begin it. At 35%, heroes now have minions, so they'll have, like, sidekicks and stuff that come along with them that make them harder to stop and murder. 75%, they will actually try to come and directly murder you because at that point you'll be spawned onto the map. And if our snake dies after she spawns on the map, that's obviously a big L for us as an elder god. And then the final one is that they can do the ritual of binding and fulfill the prophecy to stop you. So anyways, fun stuff, right? Uh, this place is pretty and shadowed right now. This place is pretty intensely shadowed. Oh, it's because of the elder tomb. I didn't realize that the elder tomb would spread that so much. Interesting. Very nice. Yeah, infiltrate the Coven of Witches over here then. Do that. Alright, the sun begins to set. 
The first shadow has taken hold. The world is darker. As you expand your shadow, the nobles and heroes of the world will become obscured by darkness and lose the ability to defend themselves against your upcoming dominion. Very nice. I love the, the writing in this game is actually quite good. In a lot of ways, it sort of reminds me of the writing from, like, Fallen London or the writing from Sunless Sea or, like, Cultist Simulator. It's quite good writing, in fact. The prose is good. All right. So how long do I have till this well is up? I got a while. I think we're at the wait a little bit. The supplicant has discovered a gaggle of alchemists. These poor fools, driven by a dangerous mixture of curiosity and naive, arrogant greed, imagine themselves on the verge of solving all of life's problems. Immortality led to gold. Their desires are pedestrian, yet their approaches could bear fruit if guided by those who actually know more. Uh, so we can lose our progress by 15 but it will raise location's shadow by 50%, and it's at 35 right now. That's pretty good. Uh, we can lose progress and gain 50 gold. We can avoid them, or we can abandon our challenge. This is a tough call. Avoid them and deceive the fools are the two best choices. The plus 50 shadow is really, really, really good. Uh, that'll basically mean that by the time we get the Well of Shadows up and running, this place will basically already be captured anyways and belong to us. Like, everyone in town will be a cultist. And so... It'll take longer to get the well up and running, and we'll have to do more challenges... In order to get there. But, by the time it's done, we'll have taken over the town. The other option is... We do nothing, and it'll be half taken over by the time the Well of Shadows goes up. And then the Well of Shadows will slowly begin to convert the place and capture it and all the adjacencies... At which point, like, we'll get there anyways. It, it kind of like, it's kind of two two ways to get to the same resolution. I feel like avoid them is a lot less risky. Uh, so like, the longer we sit here on this tile, the more we're going to accumulate profile and menace. And since we're right next to a town right now that has heroes and mages in it that will be able to see us if that goes up, I think it's a good idea to just avoid it and just play this thing naturally because we're only four turns out from the Well of Shadows anyways. What's this guy doing? Oh, he's fighting bandits as well, so they basically have, like, a lot of bandit problems around here. Oh, yeah, they do. Good lord. They have, like, all kinds of bandit problems. No wonder there's so many heroes over here. So these heroes are undertaking quests that are being given to them by sovereigns, and you can see what they're doing at any given time by clicking on them. See? They're doing challenges just like we're doing challenges. Everybody plays by the same rules in this game. So we've got an event here. Mage Gent Desions relives the news of his friend Mage Repreviv Darius' death over and over and is haunted by the memory. Without sleep or rest, they are losing their mind with grief. In these dark times, they are prey for the Elder Powers as they can no longer defend their mind against the forces that would undo it. Uh, so we can either force the memory not to fade in their mind, which will increase their mourning period by 15 turns, or... We can drive them to insanity. How much sanity does this guy have? Oh, he's got eight sanity? We can drive him insane right now? Do it. There we go. Okay. Uh, we've apparently driven someone insane. Huzzah for us. Uh, we do have this right here. It's how we win. We want this to go up to, like, 75. And so anyways, if we form a dark empire for, like, everything inside that, we get two times however many things are inside the empire's points. Like, basically, it's got a point tally up there for winning the game. We're in the very, very, very early phases of the game right now. And so, like, I just wouldn't worry about it. It's no biggie. Uh, Mad Mage Gent Desians has gone insane as their mind shatters, is now terrified of danger, and avoids it wherever possible. Their sanity has returned to maximum. They can have three different obsessions due to madness over their lifetime by repeatedly hitting zero sanity. Okay, cool. And then apparently, Cartean has declared war on Ament. Okay. And Hua has declared war on Cartean. So there's some kind of infighting going on right now. Yeah, there it is right there. Okay. So these city-states are beefing down here. When city-states are at war with one another, it makes for really, really ripe pickings when it comes to, like, taking over and causing problems. Uh, but anyways, let's get this uh, Well of Shadow installed, shall we? So there it is. 
Darkness flows across the land like a malign lake, drowning the world in its eerie gloom, blotting out the sun and driving people slowly into oblivion, their minds collapsing and their souls putrefying. Sweet. Uh, so this well of shadows... This well of shadows now needs to be defended. Uh, so there's basically two different icons that can be on a tile. There's like a consecration, and a consecration basically means that that area is really, really hard to enshadow. And it's set up by wards that are done by mages. This is our version of a ward. It's the anti-ward. This causes shadow to spread more aggressively. And so anyways, as you can see, enshadowment has gone up. Ooh. Baron Jishu Kian has fallen to the sh or is falling to the shadow and has now passed the halfway point, reaching 50% in shadowment. This will reduce their motivation to perform various actions which harm your interests, such as attacking your heroes, warding against the shadow, and driving back the shadow, or ordering the destruction of high menace locations. Nice. So he's beginning to think about joining our cult, which means he's not like pursuing us or going after us. Uh, so he's going to rest and resupply over here. How's our security on this side? Security's at seven, so we've lowered the security by one. Okay. We probably want to infiltrate over here to get this infiltrated as well in the, inf the, the tomb. Like, basically, we're trying to neighbor this up, although I don't think it's going to be that difficult because, like, this guy has the hometown hero thing, right? Yeah, so basically, I'll just use him to infiltrate the city in a minute. It'll be fine. Uh, each of these locations right here is beginning to accumulate shadow, which is great. The courtier has found a group of restless spirits. They will attempt to sif or siphon off his life energy. Okay. Um, abandon your challenge. It's fine. Like, you're just... Yeah, you're just, like, laying low anyways, and your profile and your menace are not that high. So, like, why worry about it? Come over to here. And there are... No challenges we can do over here. So I think what I'll do is I'll send him down into the town and begin infiltrating. The town has several locations of interest as you infiltrate these. So if your cult infiltrates the docks, you will get things that you can do that affect water-related stuff. So, like, we'll be able to poison the fish, you know what I mean? We'll be able to corrupt the harvest so that people slowly go mad and slowly go crazy. Uh, if we infiltrate the library, we'll be able to disseminate, like, dark tomes throughout the shelves that random bystanders will, like, borrow and read from and be driven mad. Like, things of that nature. You have, like, these little subtle ways of basically sabotaging the normal people. Uh, for right now, what I'd like is I would like to... I think I'd like to rob this village. So let's do a subtle thievery over here. It'll only take three turns. We need some money. I'm going to move the courtier over to this spot. Hopefully the mage doesn't mess with him. I don't think that she will. That should lower the security to four, which means that it's going to take 25 turns to infiltrate one of these areas of the city. Oh, never mind. He didn't level up. Okay. It's going to take a lot longer. Uh, go ahead and infiltrate the docks, I guess. I feel like that's a good place to start. That is an awful lot of infiltration, though, that we're having to do. I don't know how I feel about it. I don't know if I'm excited by the prospects. I may actually have him move on elsewhere. So if we're interested in converting King Kang Khan, uh, he doesn't like madness. And so I've got a sneaking suspicion that if we start driving the population mad, he's going to notice that and he's going to be upset about it. So in my opinion, we should just try to kind of convince people through being really, really nice guys that they, we sh they should join our cult. I think that's the best way to go. I was looking at his heir, and his heir is brave, but his heir dislikes deep ones. I, I don't really know what my play is right here. I don't know what my goal is. Um, let's have you... Can you install a Well of Shadow somewhere? You can. Go put another Well of Shadow over here in Fort Hujayu. That sounds good. Do that. That excites me. I like that idea. Uh, so what has happened over here? Oh, did they consecrate this area? Hold up. 
Aw, oh, dude, they consecrated where I put my well of shadows. You douchebags. And they did it from range, too. They didn't have to send a hero over here to do it. That's upsetting. That's deeply upsetting. I don't like that at all. Hmm. All right. Well, this place has a security of five. I suggest we make another agent. I'm going to make a... Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me look at the map. Uh, do we have any lay low areas over here? Like any any spots where we can kind of just like hide out? It looks like we do. So this is a barony right here? Okay. Alright, we're going to create a trickster over here inside Sheree Village. She's got three abilities. She can have an attack monkey. Uh, that's going to give her a minion that increases her attack power. She can be a pickpocket, which means that if she moves into a location with a hero, she can steal 15 gold for free without using her action. And then there's adorable monkey. Uh, when this trait is acquired, the closest two heroes to this character will be... They will like her, basically. She will have a pre-existing relationship with them, which will make it much less likely for them to come after you. I'm going to go with the attack monkey. Because that sounds awesome. So apparently we have Mr. Edgar. He deals three damage, has three defense, and has one HP. So there you go, Mr. Edgar. If they try to stop us, we'll hit him with that uh, evil ooh, ah! and take him out. All right, so in Sheree, I just want you to infiltrate. That's pretty much it. I want you to hang out over here and start infiltrating this area around the city of Fuveri. That way we can start putting in Wells of Shadow on the mainland to help this spread a little bit faster. So it looks like they've consecrated a couple villages. Those wards do wear off with time. I don't know if you can banish them. I don't think that you can. But, like, it would be nice. I would enjoy banishing it. Uh, the supplicant has robbed Baron Jishu Khan. There you go. He's now got 26 gold. Unfortunately, Jishu Khan was kind of broke, and so we didn't really get that much money out of it. However, if we go to town, this should give us... Ooh, our profile's way up. We need to get out of here. Yeah, let's uh, let's go back to the coven over here. Our profile is like... Uh, well, our profile's fine, but our menace is getting up there, so I don't want people to like come assassinate us or anything. All right, uh, let's go ahead and we will... Uh, Install a Well of Shadows over here. That's going to take a little while, but that's fine. We'll end our turn. Everybody's doing stuff. Infiltrating the Coven of Witches is not a terrible idea, because that'll allow me to enshadow the area. And it is connected to that village right there. Lay low for a little bit. Just lay low for a little bit, and then we'll have you do something. I want to send him into town and get him a bodyguard, because he's leveling up and he's starting to get new stats that are pretty decent. And so, like, having a full contingency of cell swords that, like, protect him with their lives, really good idea. It also turns him into a combat character so that, like, if he's got the three bodyguards, we can attack these heroes. So, like, I could go and I could kill this mage right here to get her out of the way. We would want to check and see who she's related to. So, like, yeah, we don't want to kill her because she's related to the people that we're trying to get to join our cult. But in certain situations, it can make a lot of sense to assassinate somebody. Okay, the seal is broken, we've got more maximum power, and we've got a new ability called Danger in the Dark. Increases the danger of all quests and neutral challenges in this location by 7. Uh, so basically when a hero is doing a challenge, uh, we increase the danger rating of that challenge, and then we also make it take like 7 turns longer, basically. Uh, it just acts as like a big pain in the ass. Ew, they installed another ward over here, dude. Man, they are really slowing me down right now. They are creating headaches for me. I don't like it. Uh, the Trickster has encountered a group of skeletal warriors. Stronger and better organized than most undead pawns, the skeletal warriors attack in a disconcerting silence. Their blows are unrelenting and uncaring in their unlife. We could undo and frame them for our kills the agent has committed. I lose 3 HP, and that would lower my menace. She doesn't have any menace or profile. So, like, just avoid him, I guess. We lost two turns right there, which kind of sucks. But, eh, is what it is. But yeah, this is Shadow of Forbidden Gods. I hope you guys liked it. Uh, I thought that this game was a lot of fun. Uh, the supplicant's mind is assaulted while they rest with unsettling and tiring dreams. Uh, let's go ahead and re-knit his mind, I guess. Like, we kind of need him to finish this Well of Shadows installation over here. Otherwise, it's not going to, like, they keep cutting off my areas from which I can spread shadow. 
And it's because of this elder tomb right here. This elder tomb right here is basically kind of a point of notice for the heroes of the realm. This is basically like the heart of darkness. And so they're surrounding it with wards to stop the spread at the moment. But it's not going to help them because everything's going to get ensorcelled. So I think we'll be all right. Did I get... I got 2.75 score right there. Yeah, because I drove somebody crazy. All right. Uh, but my name is Splattercat. I sift through the pile to find what's worthwhile in the world of indie games every single day so that you don't have to. Uh, thank you for hanging out with me. I appreciate you stopping on through. Leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it. And that's pretty much all I got for you.